All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to start out by just explaining Michigan's position on Cisco, and, uh, and then we're going to lead into talking about the status of the stock and the populations that we see on the eastern side of the lake. Um, which has been pretty extraordinary. It's been contributing to some amazing fisheries. People have been very excited about these fish. And I want to point out that we do, Michigan DNR does have a plan for handling Cisco. Uh, we'll go through that a little bit. Um, not a very thorough plan. It's part of our wildlife action planning process. But um, in that process, uh, it's defined as an objective that we would go in and establish a more detailed management plan for the species complex, both inland and Great Lakes. I also want to point out that this talk is an aggregate of a number of contributions from different agencies. And I should have probably also put UW Stevens Point up here. I'm sorry I didn't. I consult a lot with Wes Larson, who's a geneticist over there, and uh, funded to do some of the state-of-the-art work on the species complex at this time. So I first wanted to point out that Michigan DNR does have a strong interest in Cisco populations and understanding them, and we recognize that they're a native species that are very important to ecosystems and function, and that there has been a detriment occurring in Lake Michigan, um, which we'll get into in a few minutes, the history and the current status. In our wildlife action plan, we have a statement, and I've highlighted in red there so you don't have to read everything, but we want the successful reestablishment and will require knowledge, of, or successful reestablishment will require knowledge of environmental, behavioral, and genetic factors that support existing stocks. So we're coming from a place of understanding and knowledge about what the stocks are that we have, what their behaviors are, and understanding the systematics and the genetics of the species complex, which is very complicated and very you know, poorly defined in Europe as well as in the United States. Um, a lot of geneticists and systematists need to do some work to figure out how to allocate the different components of this complex of species. Most of the information we're working on to date was collected in the 1920s. So I highlighted in red boxes here some of the core components of this plan just so you understand what MDNR has committed to at this time. And this is related to the Great Lakes plan. We have said that we would divide, develop guidelines and best practices for restoration of Cisco. We would develop and implement a Cisco management plan for Lake Michigan. That means starting to think about harvest targets should we see a major increase in population size. We're really happy that we're supporting some valuable fisheries right now, and we'd like to see that continue. We want to determine, down in research and monitoring, uh, determine Cisco bottlenecks at different life stages and evaluate differences among lakes. We want to determine the status, distribution, and sources of mortality for Cisco. Identify and map new spawning locations. Determine genetic phenotypic variability of Cisco to inform reintroduction efforts. Uh, identify risks and benefits of reintroduction using different genotypes and phenotypes of Cisco, preferably in an experimental uh, manner. Uh, determine if remnant populations are present in southern Lake Michigan. And determine habitat suitability models, climate change assessments, and other pri priority areas for conservation. And this could be in keeping with the zonal management concept that Jay Wesley was talking about earlier, where we look at what are the best habitats to focus these species complexes in. Now I'll get out of all the words and we'll look at some data and some background. Some in, and Chuck covered a lot of this. Cisco's were recreational or historically important commercial fishery and very abundant in Lake Michigan. And he went through the different forms of types that existed in Lake Michigan. A lot of that diversity has been lost. I have a different commercial yield map than you do. But um, Lake Michigan is in red. And you can see that by 1960, they were nearly extirpated from the lake. They were no longer present in commercial fisheries. Coming into current times, 
the upper left hand slide is commercial harvest in northern Lake Michigan. And in one year, we had, when we, we think in kilograms, um, over 6,000 kilograms if you, times 2.2. That's the number of pounds that were harvested in the commercial fishery in northern Lake Michigan, statistical grid MM3. MM you go to the next slide over recreational harvest of Cisco. Most of this is occurring in that MM3 area and in Grand Traverse Bay. So up around Charlevoix, Petoskey, Beaver Island, and then over in Grand Traverse Bay. We took 14,000 fish out of Grand Traverse Bay in that area in 2016. And we don't have the 2017 estimates yet. Those estimates of harvest in recreational fisheries have been doubling almost every year. And then we also have contributions from the Ludington Pump Storage um, netting efforts, um, where they're monitoring all fish that get sucked into the intake pipe. And um, there's a little bit of a problem with this data set because it's virtually impossible below 150 millimeters to tell a bloater chub apart from a Cisco. So we have to take that data with a grain of salt. I've plotted this two ways. And it's a little hard to see that this is the lighter line right here. This lighter line is only fish, oh wait, the lighter line, I'm sorry, is all fish that looked Cisco-like pulled into the Ludington Pump Storage Plant. The dark line is only fish that were greater than 150 millimeters, giving us more certainty that they were Cisco. The thing to note, and the reason I put all three of these on one page, is that there's a timeline here in each one of these data sets for when we begin to see the exponential increase in these populations in our waters. And it's around 2010, 2011. Show you the distribution of recreational harvest. The size of the dots is the size of relative size of the harvest. And this is a combined data set from 1997 to 2016. It shows the locations where people have been recreationally harvesting, angling for Cisco and catching them. This is the same data, but I want to point out, we seem to see a critical mass that builds around the Elk Rapids area and then we begin to see a radiation out to other sites and how that harvest is proceeding. And so right now, you can see this is 2016, we're seeing an increase in the distribution of sites that Cisco are being harvested at as we build biomass. So they are expanding and reaching out into new locations. Now jumping to another type of survey, these are bottom gill net surveys that we do at Elk, Elk Rapids, which is our primary site right now. It's where we first identified spawning cisco in large numbers. And so we've been conducting these gill net surveys in November. These are all post-November 9, during the spawning season. And um, I just want to point out that throughout these years, we've seen increasing, with the exception of 2012, which I have to get below that data a little more and understand it, but um, we've been seeing increasing and leveling off of spawner abundances at this spawning location. Again, corresponding with those other data sets, and we do actually have fish dropping eggs at this location. I'm going to take a moment here to step out as well. Spawning behavior is something we don't understand very well, and there's a bit of a misnomer because we published a lot and we talked a lot about this Elk Rapids location and the fact that they're spawning on a reef there. And that was pretty exciting for us to find Cisco spawning on a reef. We don't believe that that's the only spawning behavior that they have. And we're in the process of trying to investigate whether we have pelagic spawning or that broadcast spawning that, spawning that Chuck Bronte was talking about. And this last fall, uh, USGS brought their boat up. We did acoustic surveys, and we did a large number of gill nets set at different locations in the water column. So some of these were set at the surface, some were suspended, some were on the bottom. We covered a lot of territory. And when I say we, this would be the little Traverse Bay band. I really shouldn't own this. 
Um, they set their nets at the surface in over 200 feet of water and loaded up on Cisco, some of our highest catch rates. So we have some strong suspicions that maybe there are other spawning behaviors than just orienting on a reef structure. And like Chuck said, these are plastic fish. They do a lot of different things. And we need to really understand what we have and what they're doing and what kinds of things they're putting out there. These are some larval um, toes, we call them Neustan nets, that Randy Claremont had done for a number of years, ending in 2014. And I just wanted to point that out that these different life stages, we can actually track this expansion through the different life stages. This is again at that Elk Rapids location. And um, you can see a very clear increasing trend in larval production coming off in that system. And we are very much in the early stages of a building stock. We don't know what that's going to look like or how far that's going to go. We talk a lot about morphometrics and genetics. And trust me, we talk a lot about morphometrics and genetics. One of the original documents that is referenced quite frequently is that of Celts from 1929. And it's kind of, he was this amazing guy. He traveled the world and he looked at thousands of fish and he built museum collections and thank God we have them to look back at so we can try to understand what we've had out there because we have lost it. And so I want to say this is amazing work and he collected a large, large data set. And he's responsible for basically identifying the types that we recognize today. This publication is more recent. This is 2011. Randy Claremont was the, the major contributor to it. This is Dan Yule. Um, they're looking at two, or three, I'm sorry, of the forms. Elvis, Artidae, and Manitolunus, okay? They were three of the primary forms that they would expect to see in Lake Michigan. Um, and I should say the Elvis form was more prevalent in Lake Erie. It was known to be a wide-bodied form. And um, there was some indication, or people were implying, that this Grand Traverse form that we have was Elvis-like, and that term was getting used a lot. And so Daniel, um, and this came out of this publication by Daniel, so I want to point out that this first graph over here just kind of shows those ellipses that you had seen in, in the um, diet talks earlier. Um, it shows the distinctions between Elvis, Ardidae, and Manitoulinus, okay? Now if you come over to this graph, this is the Grand Traverse Bay stock. And these are based on linear measures, which are you measure different segments of the body in the so straight lines. And this shows the Grand Traverse Bay stock and how it fell out with the other forms. And it fell out somewhere between an Elvis and an Artidae. Randy Eschenroder, Andrew Muir, a large group of people with the Great Lakes Fish Commission, as interest in Cisco started expanding, they went and they looked at all of that historic data, recompiled it, reconfigured it, and had some amazing images drawn up to show the different forms, and they're, they're just really great. We use them as a reference all the time. Um, in that publication, they reference the Grand Traverse Bay stock based on 24 fish. And they call it an Elvis-like form. And that was kind of not sitting right with us, okay? So let me just preface. This is an extra, excellent piece of work. There's a lot of great stuff there. We use it all the time to help us understand Cisco stocks. However, we had some questions about how the Grand Traverse Bay stock was being delineated and referenced in that document. So a grad student of mine, uh, Kyle Broadway, some of you may have met him, um, he had an interest in this topic and decided to take it on. So he went and re-imaged a bunch of the Celts fish down at U of M that are in those museum collections. And then he imaged a bunch of fish from Lake Superior. 
Um, and well, actually, we collected images from Dan Ewell, who is the primary research on Cisco populations in Lake Superior. And we collected fish from all over Lake Michigan. And we had two goals. We wanted to look at how contemporary means current form of Cisco. How does that relate to those old forms? How do they look? Are they like that old art today? Or are they like an Elvis? And how do they compare to what's currently in Lake Superior? So this just shows you the sample sizes we used. So we had 190 fish from Lake Michigan in five different sites. Uh, we had 95 fish from the Celts collection in Lake Michigan, 59 of the Elvis, which is Lake Erie. And then we had seven sites represented from Lake Superior from Daniel. Now this is a more contemporary way of looking at morphological comparisons. It's a shape analysis called geometric morphometry, and I'm not going to fill you up with many details, but understand that we grid an image and we have standard marks that we put on it, um, and there's landmarks and semi-landmarks. Then we put it in magic software, it comes out with shape comparisons, and we get a consensus shape, okay? And just like you were orienting on the axes on those graphs earlier, I'm going to orient, orient you on this one. This is a consensus shape for this side of this axis. You can see how fat it is, right? This one over here reflects that side thinner. On the y-axis, I want you to pay attention to the head. Longer nose, shorter nose. And here you can see how contemporary Lake Michigan relate or don't relate to the Celts collections. Now for comparison, uh, we have contemporary stocks of Lake Superior compared to contemporary stocks of Lake Michigan. Quite a bit of overlap going on here. And it was surprising to us because we had been hearing about this Elvis type form on Lake Michigan that was in theory of wider body depth the Lake Superior fish are actually coming out with a water body depth in this analysis. But I had some concerns about body depth um, because it could be related to whether it's a female or a male. Um, if she's carrying a lot of eggs, there's, there seemed there would be bias associated with that. So I had Kyle subset the data and look at uh, just a few of the measurements that were affiliated with bones in the head, okay, because that nose was coming out. And so we got very similar results when we just used the nose for comparison. Now I'm going to jump out of that. That's what we know about morphometrics, okay? Still not clear, still, in my opinion, need the geneticist to weigh in as well. And we have had them working mostly with what we call neutral markers, which have some problems. And um, they have found that just about anywhere you look, you find something that's slightly different than something else. Um, so <laughs> the, the Grand Traverse Bay stock is separating itself from anything else. And probably, although not closely related, more closely related to Lake Superior than it is to Lake Huron. However, we have some new techniques that we're using um, that are going to greatly enhance our ability to make statements about genetics. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the situation in Lake Superior, which Daniel was kind enough to provide me with a number of slides. These are pie charts. Just look at the colors. Don't worry about much else. It's the big colors. Um, the blue is Cisco. And the pink is rainbow smelt, OK? And this is from 2011 and 2016, the lakewide forage estimates from Lake Superior. And then I want to mention what Cisco eat in Lake Superior. All right, you're not going to probably recognize a lot of these names, but the bottom line is nothing has a backbone. They're all small invertebrates and zooplankton and insects. And this again was provided by Daniel. 
Then we go and we look at in Lake Superior, how do Cisco function as prey in that system? So we have two kinds of lake trout here. We have lean lake trout and Cisco wet lake trout. The Cisco wet lake trout are known for their offshore orientation in deep water. The lean lake trout are known for being higher up in the water column or closer to shore. And you can see the black on, this fi on these figures represents the Corrigonian Cori species complex. And this represents a breakdown of that species complex in the diets in Lake Superior fish from 2012 to 2016. And again, in the lean lake trout, the yellow in each of these graphs represents the Cisco that we're talking about. Another example from Minnesota waters, data 1997 to 2013. Again, the black here, these are lean lake trout, not the Ciscoet. Uh, the black is what we're looking at for the Corrigonian species complex. And bloater are red, Cisco are yellow. Now another piece of work, now we're just gonna step into Lake Michigan, right? And I'm gonna compare with one other lake, Lake Ontario. I partner a lot with biologists and researchers over there, and they are seeing an expanding population in Lake Ontario as well right now, and they're pretty excited about it. However, their fish seem to be quite a bit different than ours, at least in terms of what they eat and their size. So on the right side of each of these graphs is Lake Michigan. On the left side is Lake Ontario. So Lake Ontario looks quite a bit like that Lake Superior diet that we showed. A lot of invertebrates and zooplankton. Our fish, which I don't know how well you can see it, it's hard to see here, are eating round goby. These are spring diets. This is something that will overlap with Matt's talk because we do see a similar bias toward round goby in the spring that shifts over to alewife and other species later in the year. That graph that you just saw came from some work I was doing with a person um, out of Brockport that runs fatty acid compositions on fish, and that you saw some of the fatty acid data earlier in another talk. Well, this is a, a plot that places fatty acids in the context of their trophic level, okay? So I know that sounds really confusing, but again, Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario. Look at who's grouping together. So you have round goby and um, alewife, rainbow smelt, and cisco. Cisco are grouping out as prey in Lake Ontario. Now, if you would look at Lake Michigan, you have these fish grouping out together down here, and you have our cisco typing out as top predators. We look at the length of these fish in comparison. Um, these are actual photos of Lake Superior, or Lake Ontario versus Lake Michigan fish. And this is the Lake Michigan size range, right here with the box plot showing some variability. And then this is the Lake Ontario range of sizes that they typically see in a catch. Quite a bit of difference there, but there's quite a bit of difference in what they're eating. Oops. One other source of diet information from Lake Michigan, spring and fall, this shows that same pattern that we see with the other species. Um, in the spring, this is one year, 2014, an undergrad, Annalise Povolo, who was working with us, uh, put this stuff together for us. Um, we're working on a much more comprehensive diet investigation right now. We have hundreds of samples. We have a student at CMU who's working them up. And then we'll be taking some muscle tissues next week or a week or two um, and getting us the isotope signatures so we can place them in those other mixing models and see where the Cisco come out in relationship to the other predators and prey in Lake Michigan. But as of right now, um, this is what we see, differences between spring and fall. The blue line over there is exclusively alewife, small alewife. The red is exclusively round goby.
Now, we felt a lot of pressure, MDNR, about large-scale stocking efforts and reintroductions. Um, and I'm going to let Chuck, you know, address a lot of that. But I just want to point out that our fear, if we don't not want Cisco to do well, what we want is to be methodical about it and not jump into something too fast before we have enough information to make informed decisions. So we're nervous that the cart is way out in front of the horse here um, before we're ready to take action and move on a large scale stocking uh, plan or something like that. We have a lot of concerns about bringing in outside gametes and uh, especially in the face of this highly successful population that's clearly adapting to its environment in Lake Michigan and supporting the nice fishery and expanding every year that we look. Uh, this is some work uh, that was published on European systems that is basically lamenting the problem of having done wide-scale stocking of things all over different lakes and finding that they actually lost diversity through that process and are ex very concerned about that. So what we know, wrapping up, last slide. What we know is that expand, uh, populations are expanding rapidly in Lake Michigan and that we're learning a lot about their behavior and distribution um, of this existing stock that we have. And every time we look, we find something new and different. When we compare notes with Lake Superior, we find our distributions overlap significantly with the expectations for catching them, the standard Ardidae up in Lake Superior. We really are uncertain what we don't know. Whenever I get below the surface on this form designation, it gets really muddy. You look at the genetics, you look at the physical features, they're so plastic, they change really rapidly. Um, there's a lot to learn there. Uh, we're not sure about the number of forms in Lake Michigan, which Chuck mentioned. And one of the geneticists, Wendy Lee Stott, has some evidence that there is a different genetic form from some, a, a small number of specimens from southern Lake Michigan and Green Bay. Um, we'd like to investigate that further and understand it, but it was distinct from what we're seeing on our side of the lake. And we have many uncertainties about behavior and niches and spawning behaviors and the transferability of those patterns from one system into another. Our fish are doing something that is unprecedented for Cisco right now in their consumption patterns. How do we know what's going to happen when you bring something else in? We really don't. We have to test that. So what are we doing? We have these intensive genetic evaluations that are funded right now and ongoing to help assess the risk of different restoration strategies related to stocking and different forms being introduced into systems and how they interact with each other. We are, um, have some laboratory studies ongoing and many planned to look at how heritable genetic differences and environmental factors play off each other. So that kind of means nature nurture, if you've ever heard that. Um, is it in your genes or is it in your environment? And then we have many organized assessment efforts. There's a large number of agencies, as you saw up in the beginning of this presentation, who are trying to understand these populations and get in a better understanding of what's going on. And it's been five years that they've been doing this. So this has been happening fast. We're doing rapid catch-up and trying to plan and get things organized. So the closing thought I'm putting out there is that we really think it's important to understand population dynamics and relative risks before beginning a major stocking program for Cisco in Lake Michigan. <laughs>